Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the first talk show that discusses current issues in international business context, the IBX International Business Talk. Broadcasting live from the JWC campus at Binus Senayan, presented by the International Business Program at Binus Business School International Undergraduate Program, in cooperation with Binus TV. Managing people in international context. A topic in which everyone acknowledges the diversity and the complexity of its issue. Not only covering the internal sets of people's management, but also the challenges faced by both sides. The international culture, the foreign culture versus the local culture. My name is Dr. Marco Hermawan and I will be the host for this event. It is a privilege for me to have our speakers who will be sharing their experience and knowledge with an extensive background in managing international teams. Pak Teku Zul Karyadi, who is the joining me here, is the Head of Information, Planning and Human Resource Development of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Welcome to the talk show, Pak. Thank it's you, good Pak. to be here. And also zooming live from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Dr. Craig Selby, he is the Director of Orkan Consulting Asia and also the Academic Director of the Third Degree. Hello Craig, how are you? Good afternoon. Good, yeah, good to see you and thank you for joining the talk show. Thank you. Thank you. So let's watch a little video of both speakers. Mr. Taku Zulkar Yadi currently serves as Head of Information, Planning and Human Resources Development at the Human Resource Bureau, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Mr. Taku involved actively in giving sharing sessions about a diplomat's profession. He was also the Chairman of Committee on the Cultural Festival Team, Danau Toba, held by the Indonesian Embassy in Paris. Dr. Craig J. Selby currently serves as Managing Director of Orchin Consulting Asia. In 2009, Dr. Craig co-founded Orchin Consulting Asia with a mission to orchestrate change for clients within the communications and marketing industry. After a decade supporting corporate clients, Dr. Craig co-founded the third degree in 2019 an academy support consultancy and platform for research students designed to build capabilities in research methodology and research communication. So, Bayadi and Craig both have uh, experience living in different nations, I suppose, and uh, we can start with uh, asking Bayadi first. Um, well, I noticed that you graduated from accounting major, right? And you've worked in a big four accounting firm. And uh, what was your first motivation uh, becoming a diplomat? Since it's a different perspective that uh, coming from two backgrounds. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. First of all, I would like to thanks to you for your invitation, kind invitation to me. Pleasure. And uh, it is a great honor to be here with you to share my experiences with uh, all the students from uh, International Business School. And uh, to answer your question, my motivation to be uh, as a diplomat uh, workforce in the Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. is actually uh, a, a, a personal motivation that I would like to contribute uh, something to my uh, country. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I uh, read several uh, biography of our uh, diplomats like uh, Ali Sastro Amijoyo, right, and yeah. uh, uh, Ali Alatas, and then uh, many other uh, diplomats. And then I got um, some kind of uh, motivation whether I can be one of them, mm. I can be one of the diplomats who will serve uh, the country, yes. who will so the purpose of this country yeah. in managing relation with uh, other countries and also in international organization. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a, a, a major leap uh, from my previous uh, experience in uh, 
consulting firms, right. and then in a, by uh, accounting uh, background, then become a, a diplomat. But at that time, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs accept um, um, uh, graduate from many majors. I see. And then yeah. uh, one of the uh, the need the the, the organisation the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs wants to develop the the workforce in management teams. So my previous experience in uh, PwC, as you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers, yeah. mm -hmm. give me some extensive experiences working in uh, international uh, environment, yeah. working with uh, many foreigners, speaking in uh, English, right, yeah. and then of course I can convince uh, um, the uh, the team who recruit me mm. that I uh, I am one of the best. Uh, uh, a candidate to be a diplomat, and then I got accepted. Excellent. So, yeah, it's it's interesting when when you start to change or shift your uh, careers from the uh, business perspective or business industry towards the mm -hmm. uh, 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 governmental agencies such as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And 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 what was the actual process that you had to take in in order for you to? Because basically, uh, as bec becoming as a, a diplomat, then you have to uh, be prepared uh, to be posted in uh, any countries that uh, uh, that is out there. Basically, so what was the preparation that you had? Um, actually, the, the preparation is, um, or at that time, I prepare myself uh, to be a diplomat uh, only by having my previous experience in, in, in a corporate culture. Mm -hmm. Because I work in the uh, multinational companies like Press, Waterhouse, Coopers, uh, give me um, knowledge, skill, and attitude mm -hmm. to work mm -hmm. um, in um, uh, multi-ethnic uh, environment and also international environment. Right. That one thing. And then the second thing, I also uh, prepare myself at that time uh, using any other information that I can get, uh, what actually diplomats do, mm. and then how I picture myself how to become a diplomat. So, uh, diplomat is a profession, like any other profession that uh, we also know here, yeah. like uh, a manager uh, or uh, a doctor. So, it can be learned how to be a diplomat. So. Uh, one of my uh, um, uh, experience uh, when I'm asking the interviewer at that time, yeah. why do you choose me other than other um, people, yeah. other candidates? Uh, he said that I have a qualification that uh, can be developed furthermore to be a diplomat. So, mm -hmm. I concluded at that time that it is not at the first time uh, I will be a diplomat uh, or I will be concluded as diplomat, but the recruiter uh, gave me uh, a confidence that I can be developed furthermore to be an experienced diplomat. So I think this is, this is um, what I can say as a preparation. Right. Uh, you have to prepare. Uh, other, if you are not, if, if you didn't prepare anything, then you will fail. Mm, mm. Uh, we didn't know at that time whether I can be recruited, but uh, just do the um, all the process. And when when um, I got my uh, information that I get accepted, then hey, hurry, I get accepted. <laughs> but right. sometimes uh, it came to my mind, how can I be? Uh, recruited. Mm. I didn't have any um, experience, like experience or, 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 or uh, educational background as uh, uh, the core uh, diplomat uh, background like uh, international relations or right. economics yeah. or uh, law, for example, international law or international business. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just prepare myself uh, as I can be and then uh, uh, the recruiter said, uh, I got the qualification. Right. So this give, uh, uh, this uh, experience gives me something when I 
part of the um, Human Resource uh, uh, Bureau in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, how we develop our diploma. Actually, we are not developed from the beginning, from A, but mm. we prepare uh, all the candidates that fill in the qualification that we need, and then we develop furthermore to be a diploma. Right. This is something maybe I can share to you, my mm. uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, a little bit what we actually need, what are the manager of international teams need to see you as a diplomat or any other um, a profession that will be uh, working in an international environment. All right. Okay. Interesting. So, um, can we show the slides to the audience? We have to know from the beginning that competencies is consists of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And then in the performance, you can see there is uh, uh, I can call it as a job. You have you, you can have a target. You deliver. There is a result and. Uh, accountability. So, um, both of these aspects needed in any kind of working environment, but especially needed uh, in an international environment. You have uh, you have to have knowledge, skill, and teachers in uh, international environment, and also performance in international environments. This is something uh, I got from my experience and right now used by uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to develop our uh, diplomat to work in uh, international environment. Interesting. So basically you have the performance and competencies that you need to prepare yes. in order for you to uh, be assigned in other countries and I think there is a, a notion of that the performance is more into the technical yes. capabilities whereas the competence is more towards the soft skill. Um, from the, 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 uh, our perspective is competence that's something that you have developed by yourself and the performance is when you already in the uh, environment. So right. if you know what to do when you are uh, in this working um, environment, uh, normally there will be performance to the um, uh, measure, there will be performance that you must do and mm -hmm. then uh, result that should be accountable of. Right, okay, interesting. Um, yeah, uh, any slides that you want to yes. share again? Yes, uh, continue, please. Yeah. This is a competencies normally uh, needed in, in uh, if you are working, if you want to work in international environment in, or international uh, corporation or maybe like us in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example. Uh, knowledge uh, this is something you have to learn. Most of related business process, you have to know uh, related business process mm -hmm. in this uh, working condition, in your job, in your um, uh, corporation. What are business process, related business process, I have to know about it. And then you have to learn about lo local rules and regulation. This is something, uh, if you, something you have to learn uh, before and also during your uh, assignment. For example, when I was uh, posted in um, uh, uh, Indonesian Embassy in, in Paris, uh, I have to learn at least a little bit of local language. I yeah. have to learn a little bit of um, local cultures, mm -hmm. how to uh, communicate with uh, Parisian, for example. Right. Yeah. And then you also have to know the most of uh, common rules and regulation. Uh, each company, uh, each organization have their own rules and regulation. For us uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because we work with other uh, counterparts in uh, other governments, they also rules and regulation. So we I have see. to know, uh, we have to learn what are the rules and regulation in certain conditions. For example, like how we are entering border of uh, France you have to have visa for example yes. but you have to know what kind of visa that available this is uh, a regulation that we have to know and then um, other than uh, knowledge we also have to develop skills mm -hmm. some of these skills is the uh, are the skills normally we develop our uh, junior diploma I see. they must have uh, certain skills on communication there is a must, there is a must, uh, especially communicate in other languages. Uh, if you want to work in international environment, uh, 
normally you have to learn English. Yeah. This is the basic language now um, used in everywhere. But if you are going to work in certain countries that uh, most of the people there working only in their local language, so you have to embrace and develop your communication skill in the local language. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in any international environment, you have to work in uh, teamwork. Uh, so you have to develop your skills in working in or collaborate with your teammates in a teamwork. I don't think any kind of job that could be do it uh, alone, uh, except doctors, for example. Yeah. But those doctors also work in the team if of course. Yes, it's surgery, for <laughs> yes, example, yeah, right? Yeah, you know that's right. And then uh, in nowadays, you have to have a skills of innovation. You have to do something or think something different, something out of the box that uh, give a certain kind of uh, innovation uh, approach to um, procedures or to how you do the work. Mm, mm. It will be appreciated by uh, any manager that you can innovate something that normally do by other people. Yeah. And then um, you also have to develop the uh, skills of, uh, um, sorry, what, I forgot this. So if you can go to the, the, the uh, slides, please. The slide, please. Yeah. 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 Analytical thinking, endurance, and adaptability. Analytical thinking is something that you can just uh, uh, breaking down all the uh, major or, or uh, general issues into two specific issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I read something uh, interesting in, in, in Venus uh, portal regarding uh, whether you develop um, critical, yes. analytical, or creative thinking. For the First step, I think you have to develop your uh, analytical thinking. Mm -hmm. This is when you face certain problems, and then you can do, uh, you can think what are the options uh, by dissecting uh, from the big part to small part, and then you know how to deal with part number one, part number two, part number three, and then you conclude it in uh, all the, the parts uh, by themselves. This is something that you must learn at the beginning, yeah. and then. You have to have endurance. In many uh, countries or in many international environments, sometimes um, it differs with us. Uh, you have to work uh, many hours, for example. In our um, environment, in, in, in uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, when we are negotiating something uh, with other uh, countries, uh, it, can make, it can take uh, 24 until 72 hours uh, for not sleeping well, because okay. um, the the pressure from our government or the, from their governments or from the issues itself. So you have to have uh, 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 endure yourself. You have to train yourself to endure uh, to work in um, long hours, for example. Right. Yeah. And then the, the last thing, the last skill that needed in for especially for diplomat is adaptability, as Pa Marco um, already knows that. Uh, as a diplomat, maybe we, mm. we post it in many countries, yeah. and then we have to adapt uh, as quickly as we can, and then we do the job uh, as many as uh, expected yeah. uh, at, at, uh, uh, at the time that uh, 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 targeted by our government. So adaptability is important, uh, especially when you do in an international environment, in any cultures, in many teamworks uh, that and then if you can, if you cannot adapt with uh, all the uh, cultures that uh, normally do there, you will be uh, excluded to the from the from the teamwork, or you maybe feel alone because you cannot adapt to the to, yeah. the, to, to yeah. the um, local cultures or the regulations. So adaptability is very important. And I, the last one, I think, the last competencies that needs attitudes. This is something you have to do. And these three, I think, uh, the, the, the most prominent that uh, a diplomat must do. Mm. You have friendly, you have proactive, you have to be, uh, you also have uh, politeness. Yeah, you have to be um, polite. Friendliness and politeness is a, a major uh, differences between Indonesian diplomat and Singaporean diplomat, for example. Okay. So uh, we, uh, as we embrace by our cultures, that we are polite people and friendly people, Sometimes make us as a bridge between uh, 
stall negotiation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not easy. For example, currently uh, we are talking about the negotiation in getting the vaccines. For example, yeah. there are some countries that uh, who develop the develop the vaccine only think that this is on for our people first, but we have to uh, make them understand that the okay. vaccine is, is needed by everybody. Right. So, okay. So. Uh, Interesting topic to discuss, but uh, we need to move on to Craig. Okay. Yeah, we can carry on uh, on the second okay. session. Um, Craig, I think you have heard uh, Pak Yadi was talking about a lot of uh, things that needs to be prepared when you uh, um, starting to uh, uh, adapt to a new environments. Um, as a Western, probably if I may call you a Kiwi because you are a New Zealanders, uh, living out of your hometown. Uh, what was this first assignment when you had to work outside New Zealand, and how how was that? That, that actually, actually that takes, takes me back, back to, to my teenage, teenage years. years. Um, um, I had I finished had my, my first, first year of university, university. and very typical for uh, New Zealanders is to do a one year overseas experience. And most of most of the Kiwis, most of my classmates, uh, do a year in the UK. And I couldn't think of anything, frankly, more boring than going to the UK. I wanted to go to China. So I was in two, uh, sorry, 1992 or 1993, one of 30, three zero uh, New Zealanders granted a visa to go to China. And I did some volunteer teaching at uh, Zhuhai University in Southern China, one of the first special economic zones. I was completely, completely out, out of my depth in terms of I had no Chinese language skills, despite friends. I had no real comprehension of what I was getting myself into, other than a big adventure, which was what I was looking for. In the end, it sparked a, a lifelong interest in understanding more about Asia and the region, not just China, but very much um, Southeast Asia um, as well. It certainly was an eye-opener. I remember uh, volunteering to go to an English corner to teach uh, Chinese students who wanted to learn English. Right. Yeah. A private arrangement. I turned up, 20 or so students turned up. None of them had um, the skills or the courage, I guess. I'm not sure about that, to speak in English. And we all stood around in a park for an hour, uh, not being able to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, a giant uh, culture shock for me. Uh, that was my first exposure to working in an overseas environment. Um, then later on during my own journey, I uh, conjointly did my master's degree in Singapore. English speaking environment helped soften the experience for me. And then in 2005, I moved to Malaysia. Again, looking for adventure. Um, I didn't have a job in mind, but I got one within about two months of arriving. And I ended up by being the head of a private school. Uh, yeah. um, a few years later, I started Orkin Consulting and has been the majority of uh, the last 17 years uh, that I've had in Malaysia. Very interesting. So your your first motivation is to let's touch, let's just say to discover the world to to, to see what you haven't you you haven't seen that, uh, before. So that uh, really motivates you to go, uh, particularly in Asian country, Craig. And uh, did you um, experience some of the well, uh, let's just say uh, differences uh, when you first? stepped into a new world, let's just say, or uh, is there anything that you can share there? There, there, there are. Um, if I could actually have the 
third slide from my presentation, I've got a couple of anecdotes that I had wanted to share about some of the experiences that were very different um, for me and to talk about how I coped with, with those. So hopefully if, you, if you're able to put that up for uh, maybe me. Maybe if you can share uh, Craig's uh, presentation. So I so actually, if we could have slide three, please. Fantastic. So my first international experience in business was going to China to, in 2001. Uh, I went to Nanjing and I spent several months. I used to go in the early 2000s, I would go to China every year for about three to four months uh, for work, for a little bit of business and uh, another purpose, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But I went to Nanjing and at the time I had a consultancy company in New Zealand and we were focused on the international education sector and how we can help uh, streamline and smoothen the processes for international students coming into New Zealand uh, to do university studies. And I was fortunate enough that I got an opportunity to present to a particular university. And the university was about one hour drive out of Nanjing, quite a, a large, uh, well-known city, obviously. What I didn't realize is I was presenting to the university president. Now, I'm not particularly a shy person, so presenting to anyone is not a concern for me. But what became a great learning point, and this really came back to language, I was asked to present um, about the business, about what we're trying to do and about how we wanted to uh, work with or collaborate with the university at the time. And my business partner was from China. So the ability to have somebody as a translator was fantastic. But I'd never been put in this situation before. And we're in a meeting and there everybody is talking and getting to know each other and I'm being helped with translations and I was asked to make my presentation. And having never done this before, I stood up and I spoke for 30 minutes. Right. Unfortunately, having never done this before, I never realized I was meant to stop, take a break, let my translator help uh, to go through and to make it easier. So here's this um, sort of rather gung-ho uh, Westerner, um, speaking, talking, talking, talking for 30 minutes. And my translator wasn't able to keep up, nor was anyone else in the room. Right. And this was, I guess, a very uh, early introduction into you've got to change your mindset. You can't go as if you are doing in your own country or, or an English speaking country, that it has to be processed differently. Then we moved on to lunch. Uh, you know, 11.30 in the morning, out comes the Chinese rice wine. And the entire experience was no longer about business. It was about trying to get to know you, but in the process of uh, being forced to drink. And that was quite a surprise as well because it changed the dynamic and I wasn't expecting that. Um, I subsequently got used to it, but I certainly wasn't expecting it. So the types of protocols that were associated with this were a little bit of a challenge. Now I've had a really interesting one in here. I want to talk from the same experience, uh, the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was actually married to a mainland Chinese whose uh, family owned a construction company in China. And my father-in-law got kidnapped by his workers. And to me, my, my New Zealand sensibility says, you go to the police, you let that be handled separately. But the reality was they simply paid a huge amount of money to get him back. And the decision was so instant. It was forget the police, forget anything else, don't negotiate pay, get back. And I included that there because 
in my entire life, I would never have expected something like that in an ordinary family business situation. But surprisingly, it was relatively common to have happen. Moving forward a few years, when I came to move to Malaysia, okay. I ended up yeah. by running a private school. Okay, Craig, um, we can discuss the, uh, your experience uh, in Malaysia, but we need to uh, do a break and uh, don't go anywhere because the story is getting excited and we will come back uh, after this. collaborate with University of Newcastle because uh, of so many reasons. One, they are ACSB accredited, which means they are worldly and globally renowned for their business programs. According to Venus, uh, we also are ACSB accredited in Indonesia. Number two reasons is they are ranked 200 in the world as well as top 10 in Australia for the business and commerce program. We're excited to be offering the two degree program here in Jakarta where you will have the unique opportunity to graduate with a business degree as well as a degree from the University of Newcastle, Australia. You will become part of a globally connected student body with opportunities to connect and network with Australian businesses here in Indonesia and also in Australia. We look forward to welcoming you to the Two Degree Programme. Welcome back to the IBX talk show, Binusi and Friends. Um, as we uh, previously mentioned, um, the managing international business context is the uh, some sort of uh, uh, skills and extra skills that people need to uh, pay attention to. And as we heard from uh, what Craig uh, mentioned in the previous session, that um, you, you have several things that you need to adjust, uh, including when you had to talk uh, uh, 30 minutes without stop and then you didn't realize that uh, there was a translator that was waiting for you to, <laughs> to translate your uh, uh, speaking. So uh, uh, what are other things when, when, when you had an experience uh, when moving to uh, Malaysia, Craig? The, the bigger challenges, and I, these have been touched on by my co-presenter as well today, uh, relate to um, employment laws and learning what employment laws were. Um, it was very interesting to be part of a business, uh, my first job in Malaysia, part of a business where although I was running the business, I had a lot of interference from the key stakeholders, the key shareholders. But what we also had was uh, a, a very unhealthy disrespect for uh, process within employment laws. And one of the challenges I faced was not only understanding what the employment laws were within Malaysia, but adjusting my own practices and what I accept um, as ethically appropriate uh, to fit in with what local practices were. Um, I had a, a key shareholder who wanted me to terminate a staff member instantly with no justification. And the ways in which that was suggested to me in order to remove this person from the team was something that from my own experience, uh, from my own background, were completely unacceptable. So that was a challenge. As I moved into having my own business rather than working for others, the challenges became not only looking at or dealing with um, perhaps local staff, because there were some additional differences there, but it was very much in terms of being an expat entrepreneur within an industry that was very localized. I believe I was uh, one of only two expat 
uh, business owners within um, the agency, uh, communications and branding agency industry at the time. And that also posed challenges because people would view me as either potentially difficult from a language perspective, from a cultural understanding perspective, or worse, from a pricing perspective. And with that, my business partner and I had to spend some time working out uh, who we would uh, court um, from a business perspective, my business partner being uh, local Malaysian. And it was obvious the expat clients liked uh, dealing with myself because I became a filter for my local staff. The local, um, the local clients enjoyed dealing with my business partner, but then wanted to make sure for some strange reason that I had input into the process, but they preferred talking with him directly. That was yeah. um, probably the, you know, an interesting learning curve that we had. My personal challenge was on local staff and languages. And I made quite a few mistakes along the way, hiring people that could speak Chinese but could not read and write. Yeah. Yet I needed them to translate a lot of written material for me, for example. Um, different or learning the, the graduate profile of different universities so that I could understand where is the best university that I would like to engage teams from because I know that they are prepared, even though multiple universities were offering uh, similar qualifications. And I think the, the last part I want to comment on was actually my personality. Uh, many people who know me well know that I am quite sarcastic, I'm quite uh, direct. Yeah. And a lot of people still didn't know whether I was joking or I was serious. And going into meetings, you know, unlike the diplomatic service where it's always friendly, it's always polite, uh, some of the meetings you go into are not like that. Right. And people don't know how to take me until they learn that I've been here for so many years and realize I understand what goes on in politics, what goes on in the economy. They found it challenging to um, take my viewpoints because they just thought I'm just this brash New Zealander who turns up. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you said um, that uh, you are considered as foreigners and then you need to adapt to the uh, new environments, for instance, in uh, Malaysia. I think, I think the next question goes to you, Payadi. And then uh, if, you are, if you are facing with uh, or, or talking with the foreigners, uh, I mean, uh, uh, do you uh, or are you the one who is actually trying to adapt with them or you expect them to adapt to you as, as Indonesian, perhaps? That's, uh Challenging question. <laughs> Actually, from my uh, experience, it both um, it, it it goes with those two sides. I see. You have to adapt to uh, the environment, but uh, also the people that you are dealing with also must have, uh, must adapt to you. Um, this is can be applied in different contexts. For example, when I am a team leader and my uh, team member consists of many uh, people from different cultures um, or different uh, educational background, yeah. then um, I can set the rules to them and they have to adapt to me. But when I am a team member of a bigger uh, teamwork, uh, team collaboration, for example, the multinational uh, collaboration, I have to adapt uh, with them as well, uh, the, the 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 local cultures or the re the rules and regulation will will also will always shape the how we interact with each other. That's why Craig said that uh, employer rules in Malaysian, for example, or Chinese, 
uh, it's different with the New Zealander. This is something that I, uh, in my previous uh, presentation, you have to learn about the local uh, regulation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, do, uh, do all the regulation that uh, must be there. Yeah. This is something you have to adapt yourself to, to the regulation. But also the, the, the cultures. Um, I have experiences that my first uh, experience when I'm going abroad is when I do internship in uh, Washington DC. Yeah. This is the first international flight that I had. And then um, I got shocked with the, uh, some uh, cultures there. That the, the cultures also in, uh, 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 mix with the regulation. For yeah. example, like uh, queuing. Mm -hmm. um, normally in Indonesia, right now, it's, it's, it's common to, be, uh, to queue, to queue uh, in certain uh, services. But when I was there, so everybody queue in anything. So you queue at a uh, 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 coffee shop, yeah. you queue at the um, uh, ticket booths, yeah. and for, for any places. places yeah. Any places. So uh, I, I didn't get used with the queuing here um, um, in, in Indonesia at that time. So uh, I had to adapt myself. Oh, I have to queue, and then yeah, just wait for my turn to get uh, being serviced. Uh, other cultures that um, no uh, other norms, for example, like in in, in diplomatic uh, arena, for example, mm -hmm. we normally have uh, you know like kind of um, uh, uh, celebration or a kind of um, um, a dinner or a lunch together with other other uh, diplomats. Yeah. For example, when when I have lunch with my colleagues um, from. Um, um, from US, they serve me wine. Mm. Then what should I do with the wine? Yeah. Because I'm Muslim, you know, Marco, uh, uh, as Muslim, you, it is forbidden to drink alcohol. So yeah. I cannot say no at that time <laughs> because it will embarrass myself, yeah. but also it will humiliate um, the host. So uh, what I did was uh, try to sip the the glass, the wine, yeah. the wine but not <laughs> yeah. actually drink it. Okay, so okay. that's what I did. And because there is so many, uh, I think five or six people there, so the host did not notice me at the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's something that I have to adapt at that time with, 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 the, with the local uh, norms. This is, this is the, the, the culture. Yeah, uh, yeah. Drinking alcohol is, is, is everywhere there. So uh, that's something that, that uh, from my experiences. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, thanks to my experience in uh, uh, working at the PwC, I also work with uh, many foreigners mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. developed me to be part of an international team. So yeah. I know about the punctuality. Yeah. This is very important in, in many uh, countries. Uh, I learned about discipline as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And I also learned how to manage things uh, according to the rules, this is something that uh, I think I got from my experiences in the uh, corporate world. Yeah, you mentioned about um, norms because uh, uh, normally this uh, norm thing, when you are entering a new uh, place or a new country, is that uh, uh, you need to be able to sense that this norm has can be studied uh, formally or informally. Craig, when you when you went when you visited uh, China or Malaysia, um, um, yeah, you mentioned that you, you you have to comply with the regulations that uh, they impose you uh, in establishing a company and so forth. But uh, on the other hand, you also have to learn the unre well, let's just say unwritten regulations that you uh, uh, have to adapt. Um, which one is more challenging for you? The regulated uh, or the unregulated one? The, the, the unregulated, the, the cultural norm, norm. But they're also the ones that are easier to embrace. Uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to come with both an open mind, but also a willingness to make friends amongst them. A lot of expatriates who come into Asia make the mistake of staying within the clique. 
So they don't, don't get the cultural underpinnings. They don't get to understand how things work. And so, some of the, you know, just even timing issues are something you learn through experience, but when you have locals telling you, look, this is how it is, it actually helps you to adjust your own expectations, ask questions so that you can start moderating behavior to fit in. It doesn't mean you change you, your own paradigms, but you certainly moderate the behavior or your expectations so that you can understand this is quite normal. Um, this is something that, that is going to happen. Right. And um, the fact that you had uh, you, you, you traveled to a couple, uh, couple of Asian countries, China, Malaysia, probably in, to Indonesia to some extent. Uh, uh, do you have to, did you have to, did you have to readapt uh, when every time you moved in, uh, moving in and then moving out? In, in a way, yes. The, the flow of uh, how things worked was certainly different. I've been uh, in and out of Indonesia for projects for I think the past eight years. Um, I had a client here, a Singaporean client based in KL. Uh, we were uh, working on property uh, together and she had invited us, uh, my business partner and myself, come and take a look at some of the properties she had done uh, in Jakarta. And we got over there we had this expectation that it would be very, very similar to KL. And as she kept saying, try this, do this, it will be different. The subsequent trip, and this is actually the trip I think I met you at, at, at um, I remember trying to set up three meetings in Jakarta on the same day in three different parts of the city. Now in KL, that's very realistic. Uh, I managed two meetings that day because I just simply couldn't get through the traffic. Um, I was expecting a different pace. Uh, all of these, you know, the more I talked to people, the more I got to understand how I need to moderate what or how I approach things, including just setting appointments to be able to make things happen. Um, so, yeah, every country certainly has its quirks. Uh, it certainly has its uniquenesses. It helps to be able to have some grounding from others first before you land, but it's not always going to be possible. Right. Very interesting discussion uh, with Payadi and Craig. We'll be back right after this. The world we live in is always changing, but the chance isn't always right. What if you could make things right with just a touch of your finger? Whoever you are, anytime, anywhere, now everybody can create a chance. With just a touch, you could transform yourself and everyone around you to become smart viewers. Join the movement. I am a smart viewer. Welcome back to the IBX talk show. Um, a very interesting discussion that we had with uh, Payadi and also Craig from uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, um, talking about uh, managing international teams. I guess uh, there are a lot of things, uh, if you want to extend this, it can be all night, <laughs> all day, but uh, then again, we need to move to our uh, next session, uh, which we will be discussing about uh, working virtually. I think this is uh, 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 a topic that is currently happening right now because of the pandemic situation and uh, almost all people around the world are working virtually. Yeah? Either they are working uh, work from home uh, or 
the company's regulation that they had to work 50% uh, working in the office and the other 50% are working from home. So um, I think this is a great discussion uh, uh, with our speakers that uh, has there been any changes uh, uh, in terms of Again, adapting, adopting, yeah, uh, and 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 all these kind of changes that uh, reflect the international team. So, uh, Payadi, do you have any experience working uh, after or during the pandemic situation? Yes, of course. Uh, the this pandemic affects everything, like you said, and disrupt everything, including in uh, how we do things in Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yeah. Uh, we are having a new normal now <laughs> working virtually is uh, common now yeah yep. this new normal like any other new things always brings challenges and, yeah. and if you ask the challenge that we have yes uh, many things now we should do virtually uh, I think some some working condition that uh, should be adjusted at least what we do in mm. in, 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 in the ministry is uh, uh, embrace the the fact that we now communicate through uh, gadget or, or, or uh, media, uh, like we do things, uh, we do meetings with the uh, Zoom meeting or, yeah. or any other video conferencing uh, uh, tools, and we also manage the uh, the performance with using our WhatsApp group, for example, yeah. and other collaborative uh, media that we have. Yeah. This is something that uh, we didn't used to do it uh, before. So, I, uh, the the most I think the most uh, interesting effect that uh, we have to face is uh, the use of technology. Yeah. Um, if the company, or for example, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs did not invest in uh, those tools, those gadgets, those uh, media, yeah. we cannot do uh, something like this. So the, the new normal bring us to new level of working condition that mm. we use mm. based on uh, the technology. Interesting enough, in, in the ministry, some of the jobs is confidential. Yeah. So uh, we have, we develop our um, own channel, like a, a secure channel mm -hmm. that uh, used by our leaders, like the minister or the director general in communicating things. But to us, in, in, in technical level, normally use Zoom or yeah. any other uh, tools that we can use. But uh, the point is, if we not, if we didn't embrace this technology, how to invest the in, invest the to the software, the hardware, and how mm. we ca uh, we uh, develop our teams to get used with the gadgets, yeah. with, to get used with this. I think we cannot do that. Yeah. So you have technology that you need to adapt every yes, time, every changes. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess there's a sense uh, since the pandemic happens last year, um, especially in the, the Indonesian has had, uh, the Indonesian has to adapt uh, uh, pretty mm -hmm. much quickly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in terms of norms, perhaps, let's just go back to norms, where, okay. where normally uh, the Indonesian likes to, or prefer to shake hands or meet yes. in person or mm -hmm. having chat more than the other culture, perhaps. <laughs> After the pandemics, has there been any changes in those kind of uh, of course north? Yeah. yes, of course uh, there is uh, those kind of norms reduce a lot <laughs> all right okay. um, I can show you some example like in a negotiation table uh, um, in in a negotiation table when we are negotiating something, mm. for example in the UN in the, uh, when we are discussing a resolution for Palestine, for example, normally we are we we do all the negotiation things in the yeah. same room, but during this pandemic we cannot do that. So we cannot. We will. Uh, we 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 do the negotiation from our headquarters. Yeah. So we exchange ex uh, notes. We exchange uh, views using uh, television. You you using uh, 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 other media that we can have. So normally something. Uh, when we do negotiation, uh, there is always side event. Mm. Side event means when uh, the negotiation stall or we cannot reach any conclusion in negotiation, 
normally we can go outside to have drinks with our counterparts, yeah. uh, to have dinner with counterparts, and then uh, talks in informal way. So during this pandemic, we cannot do that. Yeah. So, uh, but we, uh, our teams normally use the telephone. This is, I think, the, the most common now, mm -hmm. using telephone uh, call directly between the minister, yeah. for example, uh, to, add, to her counterparts in, 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 in any, any countries. Uh, and uh, this, this conversation in telephone is recorded, mm -hmm. and also some people in the background uh, of the minister. So right. the minister will, will chat with, this, his, uh, with her teams, and also in the, the, the part, but we cannot, we, we didn't know what are they talking about. <laughs> But oh, so it's a closed phone, not an open speaker phone. It's a closed phone. phone. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, normally, when, when we, we do negotiation, the, the minister just say, uh, when, we, when she has to discuss something, yeah. just so she, she uh, has to turn, turn, her, turn her face uh, and face discuss to with back the, to the yeah. team. Ah, see. But right now, I have to do it in, in the, uh, with, it, with uh, using telephone. So it's challenges. Mm. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a challenge, but uh, there's something we do uh, today yes. uh, using any kind of technology uh, to all, to to make sure all the uh, jobs get done right Craig you 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 are also an expert in uh, communications and uh, negotiations perhaps you you have uh, another view on the the new normal during the pandemic on how people are doing uh, negotiations nowadays personally it's actually been really quite refreshing. Um, I like the fact that there has been a change in dynamics between people through having to use Zoom. I think the great thing that uh, we have, and I'll just use an example, is we put this down a lot more during our discussions that are uh, video-based or, or Zoom-based. Um, but it's also from a team perspective, especially in a small business where you're used to working with everybody um, quite hands-on and you're used to seeing them very regularly. It does require you to change your level of trust and the level of expectation that you have of your, your teams, but also of what they have of you. When you're in uh, an environment where you're seeing each other, there's always that chance to, you know, to ask, to get help, to get instant feedback. But we don't necessarily have that option uh, when we're looking at remote learning. Last year, at the beginning of the lockdowns for Malaysia, we onboarded two new team members, one of whom was not even based in Malaysia. And that was a really interesting experience because although everything worked out well, one of them had technological issues, which meant uh, being in the country that she was, internet was not stable. So even holding a Zoom meeting would not happen. And we had to change how we wanted to communicate with her, but also how we set up uh, group activities so that we could make sure that she could fit into that at times where the internet would work. Now these seem like you know tiny little practical problems, but they impact more than one person and they influence the flow of how work will be done. We've gone from, I guess, those lovely lunch meetings that you know that have just been discussed, where you can just sit down and have an element of social as well as business. We've gone to more structured. And when I do, or when, the, when we actually do meetings with Europe, um, we found ourselves going from what would be a typical two hour discussion to 30 minutes. And I've even had one, uh, one potential uh, collaborator that I was working with schedule me for 15 minutes only. Now that's something that would never have happened in a normal environment. The other challenge that I think has, has been faced, and we, we've just sort of touched upon that a little bit, 
is in embracing and understanding technology. I have a, um, a content provider who's a professor, has been uh, teaching and researching for many, many years, very well accomplished. I had to teach him how to use Zoom. He had no idea. Um, his suggestion was Skype, which I still have. He didn't know how to turn his camera on. So we, <laughs> I know. Um, so we had a few hiccups where not everybody is confident with the technology. When prior to uh, 2020, we would have perhaps done a slightly different approach or we would have had access to more people to support. You know, at the university, he would have had the IT person come straight up to his office and would have solved everything. Yeah. In this context, I had to be the IT person and I can't say I knew that much better. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there is a notion whereby um, people are starting to uh, find their way in, 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 in looking at this new normal. What is the new normal means to them? Um, uh, how do they actually uh, readjust this themselves? Uh, because I think we are currently on one and a half years uh, after the yes. pandemic mm -hmm. happens, after we've been doing a lot of things uh, in, in a new base. Uh, I have to, to work at home most of the time rather than in the office, doing 80% um, of the conversation by Zoom. You know, those kind of things are currently uh, uh, making a new culture. So, and and uh, it, what interests me is that uh, when, Craig, when you said um, the, 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 the negotiation and communication are more structures than before, mm -hmm. meaning that, um, I think, I don't know, maybe you have another view, Payadi, uh, uh, as Indonesian. Probably now the Indonesian are more effective, efficient when they now addressing things uh, during the meetings or do they actually still have this amicable chatting or a chit chat although they are still in Zoom or <laughs> what, what, yes. what was your view? Yeah, um, I agree with you that uh, and also what Craig said, it's not only the technology that uh, we should embrace but we also have to change uh, our attitudes towards yep. meetings for example yes you said normally when in in the in a uh, normal negotiation or normal meeting we can chit chat uh, to our next uh, partner yes that's right. <laughs> uh, but uh, in the zoom we cannot do that and we also have to uh, yeah you also mentioned about uh, more efficient for example and uh, in, in the timing uh, there are limited uh, time uh, for everybody to talk, mm -hmm. to speak. So uh, we have to uh, develop ourselves. We have to adapt to this, to this kind of uh, new norms. Uh, yeah. um, it also affects us in, 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 in uh, the ministry. But uh, one thing that I should uh, underline as well is regarding the managing the teams <coughs> yeah. in, 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 in this uh, new normal. Um, like I said, uh, as a manager uh, right now, I, uh, yeah, uh, Craig said there should be trust. Mm. Yeah, the, the trust, we should Im uh, emphasize the trust to them. Uh, I trust you to do this, but we also make them accountable. So yeah. this is something that normally we, we, we do it by face to face, just saying, uh, what are your results uh, today? But right now we cannot do that directly. Yeah. So we have to wait maybe a day or two days, and then uh, when there is no um, uh, uh, information from them, we have to call them mm. and ask them how uh, are you doing? How how did how did you do your job? Uh, is there any difficulties? And uh, not only us as the manager, all the team members also must. Um, uh, right now, our phone is uh, 24 hours on, mm. so mm. when something <laughs> happens, uh, we can be contacted yeah. uh, and asked, uh, because everybody now working from home. 
So I should call my, my team member uh, if any problems exist uh, when I didn't receive any information from them in two or two days after I give them the jobs. Mm. This is something uh, uh, um, normally we did uh, in face to face. So yeah. today we, can, we cannot do it, so yeah. we, we do it by uh, WhatsApp group yeah. or, or um, uh, phone call. Yeah. Um, so all this technology is actually assisting you in? Yes, assisting us and also negotiations uh, affect us yeah. uh, in the context of using them. Mm, mm, so mm. we have to get used using the, 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 um, the technology. Uh, if we cannot do that, we have to teach them to do that, like yeah. Chris said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We teach everybody to use the same uh, platform that we yeah. can use to work as a, uh, a, a teamwork. Very interesting. So um, again, probably the, 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 the new normal um, that we are currently doing is uh, meaning that we need to learn these new sets of culture, new sets of norms, uh, the way in which we communicate with uh, other person, other counterparts are now uh, changing in a sense that we also need to change uh, the, the culture that we used to uh, have. Uh, even if that we are uh, in any nations, any countries, uh, there is a sense that there will, uh, there will be um, a common a common culture that uh, provides you with a lot of things that uh, uh, learns by doing. Very interesting. Um, I think it's a good opportunity as well for uh, the participants to uh, start asking questions. And uh, you can type your questions in the chat box or uh, feel free to uh, raise your hands. Uh, and ask questions to both of the speakers, Payadi and Craig. Um, and we uh, are opening the question now. Right. Any questions? <coughs> right. Um, I think there is a question that says, uh, a question for Craig. There is a lot of pressures on expatriates to adjust on local cultures. What about locals adjusting to expats? And what's your experience in that situation? No matter where you go to, it's always going to be a two-way street. You as the expatriate have to adjust and to, to find ways to understand. But in any situation, people will also need to look at how can they fit uh, with you. Now, let's take culture or geographic origins out of this. Whenever we go into an office, we've got to find a way to be part of a team. You know, if everybody is uh, same culture, same background as us, we still have to find a way to fit in. And I think that's a, a very important element. I call it business as usual in a way, because no matter where I go, you know, I will make some concessions. By default, other people will make some concessions. When you've got an end goal, uh, in sight, everybody will work to make that end goal happen. My overall experience has always been that people are very forgiving if you are different and they will allow you that little bit of room so that things can happen. And I've never had a situation where people have been uh, putting up barriers to, to enable that to happen. I've always found that human nature itself gives us uh, the sensibility to you know, learn to learn to appreciate others and learn to adjust and as that accumulates more and more the next time you go into a situation you're more heightened about how you want to approach it you've got that prior learning that helps you think should i be approaching this a little bit differently but so too do everybody else who is part of the scenario as well. Mm. Yeah, um, and as well, when uh, uh, adjusting or, or, or let's just say calibrating uh, between the two counterparts is also uh, the essence. Maybe can I uh, yes, Payadi, uh, please. I think this is uh, my uh, came from my experience um, in working in PwC. Yeah. Uh, you see, in PwC Jakarta, uh, we work with the 
managers or uh, partners from other countries, so, so we call it as expatriates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, we work in Jakarta, so <laughs> in Indonesian uh, environment, but using um, uh, 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 PwC cultures, yeah. and then the leaders is from uh, many countries. Right. So my experience working with them is, yeah, we have to adjust with them, and they also adjust with us. But for uh, for myself, normally uh, uh, I ask how to do the job uh, with them. For example, my I have a previous manager from Netherlands, for example. So um, when I get introduced. Uh, for the first time, I just directly ask. Uh, so, what do you expect me to? What do you expect me to do the job? Yeah. How do you expect me to do the job that you give to me? So, yeah. he set certain uh, target. They set certain um, uh, rules. They set certain procedures. So, it is agreed upon uh, between us, and then it makes us easier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, just ask whether you cannot understand or yeah. cannot how we have to adapt with you with right. your uh, pace with your with your uh, jobs with your with your responsibility uh, and we support you so uh, we need each other actually so mm -hmm. uh, a good manager will explain to their team members uh, how this job will be get done and yeah. then uh, how I how, how uh, they want to do it uh, at what time by what time and then um, uh, using any tools that are available, they should uh, communicate this to the team members. And this is the time when you adjust with the team members or, or, or team leader from other uh, or foreigners or, or expatriates for, for this. I think I think talking uh, 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 explicitly is something that uh, yes. probably most of the Asian, especially the Indonesians, yep. uh, are. Uh, struggling, they, they they tend not to uh, speak out yes. outspoken, and probably they I don't know they 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 expect the other counterparts to understand what they want. I think that's something that right now you should uh, uh, change that. I uh, see. Yeah. You you cannot uh, always um, make your experience or your cultures as uh, would not. Talk first, mm, mm, or with as Indonesian, as Indonesian yeah, yeah. Uh, when you are working in international environment. Uh, yeah. So you have to speak out. You have to be confident mm. to uh, ask to do things and take a risk. Mm. Uh, I think in, in my last presentation said, uh, "Be brave, yeah. uh, take a risk, and have fun." Right. So uh, uh, when you communicate openly, it will uh, make us better in, 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 right. in, it's in a working of, into each other. It's a matter of communication. I think yes. that goes to the same questions, uh, the next questions that uh, one of the uh, mm. uh, participants are asking, how to overcome a lack of self-confidence when you are about to work in a different country? So yeah, Craig, probably you have uh, an experience working in different countries and how do you resolve I, I think, this? I think very simply, it's the fake it until you make it scenario. You know, it, no matter what, you're always going to be faced with something that is unfamiliar. You're going to have imposter syndrome to an extent where you do question uh, your suitability for the role, for the team, uh, even for the location. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, you were placed there, hired because you would deem to be the right person for the moment. And that comes back to, we have to be telling ourselves, we work for it, we can just simply make it happen. Um, I don't think there's any key tricks. I can't suggest anything that sort of will instantly turn on a switch. But if you've got to whatever stage in your career, you are naturally ready to take on the next steps. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with Greg. There is no uh, any particular uh, training to <laughs> reduce your self or confidence. Yeah. Um, it comes from yourself. Uh, you have to deal with it, and yeah. how you how you deal with it is by on your own uh, approach. 
like myself for example when um, yeah when i was uh, 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 posted mm. uh, or not, not not posted maybe when i assigned yeah. to do jobs by myself mm. uh, instead of with a team yeah my team is there but they are in the office <laughs> i go directly and to you the, have to do it by yourself but, right? but uh, i by myself at at, at that time uh, I, I, uh, for two days uh, audit in uh, korean companies for example right uh, all the all the uh, uh, leaders and managers are korean mm. so i have to speak with uh, using translate translator right uh, i did not have any experiences working with Korean. Right. I only equipped by my extensive knowledge on auditing and also uh, the responsibility assigned by my boss, by my leader, to do this and then to do this. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this is something uh, always uh, 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 the confidence is reduced for a moment. Yeah, yeah. But that's right. Just be brave. I I, I brave myself mm. uh, at the time. Uh, yeah, at the beginning. Uh, you are a bit uh, shaking. Yeah, right? yeah, it's shaking. <laughs> a bit shaking. A bit uh, how I'm going to uh, get the information from them. Yeah. Um, uh, if the translator is uh, lying, for example, <laughs> I don't know. We don't so know. We yeah, don't exactly. know about it. But um, just let it go. Just let it flow. Um, just be brave. Asking one question and then second question and then continue gradually i get my confidence mm -hmm. uh, uh, to even to ask harsh question with them right. yeah i think in my experience uh, if you have a lack of self confidence you just uh, be brave to face it yeah by your own way. Mm. Uh, some people or my friends uh, sometimes also suggest me to do uh, um, rehearsal before right. doing something, like 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 our <laughs> talk show here. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> maybe by rehearsing some things by uh, speaking in in front of the mirror. Mm -hmm. if, if this uh, related with uh, communication, uh, you, yeah. you can you can see yourself in the mirror and then asking those questions, asking questions in Indonesian, in Bahasa or in, in English, make you uh, uh, proud by yourself and yeah. then make you uh, confidence. And then just do it. Uh, mm -hmm. There always, uh, there is no way you will uh, be the best at the first time. So there yeah. always a continuous learning. So you, you just know your, what uh, if you, there's something wrong, you know it is wrong. So just correct it uh, yeah. and in the future. Yeah. So, so there's nothing wrong trying it. No, no. You no. just have to do it. To do it, yeah. yes. You just yeah. be brave, take the risk, and yeah, have fun. <laughs> have fun. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, we can take one uh, or even two questions from the audience. You can. Raise your hands uh, and address the questions to either Pak Yadi or Craig. Um, it would be great if you can uh, uh, take some of the notes and uh, you can um, somehow reflect to, to, to what you have, what you are currently doing, and what what will you be doing. Uh, questions from the audience? Anyone raises their hands? Virtually, yeah, of course. <laughs> right. Um, while we are waiting for uh, the audience to raise their hands virtually, <laughs> um, a bit of questions, yeah, probably to uh, Pak Yadi. Yeah. Uh, what is the most difficult? Well, I'm not saying difficult, it's challenging. What is the most challenging culture that you have ever faced? In terms <laughs> of, probably in terms of nations. Uh, these people are more well, difficult to adapt or? Um, I think uh, each countries have their own cultures that are uh, always challenging for us at the yeah. beginning. But when we already 
learn about those cultures, those norms, those uh, common uh, expression or common uh, things to do, yeah. then we, we get adapted. So uh, in any kind of uh, in any kind of situation, but yeah. uh, maybe when not from my experience, uh, I can uh, share my st uh, uh, stories of my friends. Yeah. Um, uh, during their assignment in some conflict wars, for example, conflict countries yeah. like uh, in um, Afghanistan or maybe in uh, currently in in, in in Syria, right, uh, or in Yemen. So uh, at this situation, uh, the, the 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 challenges is not the local culture. Yeah, the yeah. challenge is how we survive. Mm, mm. <laughs> in those uh, harsh situation, right? Yeah. So uh, we as diplomat uh, have to do the jobs. Uh, we assigned by by our countries to do the uh, uh, the, the relationship with the mm. countries. Even though we know that the country is uh, in war, for example, right, or in yeah. a conflict situation, so adapting with the uh, uh, boom explosion sound for example wow, <laughs> or shaking building because yeah, of yeah. Uh, I can imagine uh, how the, frightened yeah. person there, is yeah. I think in, in, in a diplomat this is uh, the most uh, challenging situation uh, not only we we have to report to the, the headquarters to Jakarta mm -hmm. what are the situation but we have to survive by ourselves yes. so, uh, we yes, of course, we equipped by many kind of um, secure environment like uh, uh, fences, like a bunker, like uh, even a, a gun for, right. for, for sometimes uh, <laughs> when we go outside and then uh, uh, something happened and then we have to use the gun. So, wow. um, <laughs> but this is something that uh, we have to prepare. Uh, from the headquarters, so yeah. the the diplomat assigned there uh, must have series of um, trainings um, to not only for their uh, knowledge and skills and attitude, but mm. also their psychological uh, uh, insight. Yes. So yes. they have to to embrace the situation, uh, adapt with the situation, and then try to having fun there. <laughs> I cannot imagine trying to have fun <laughs> I in, think the in, in, war zone. in the in the in diplomatic <laughs> okay. ways. It is the the most challenging situation that uh, we have to adapt in international environment when right. it is a conflict or it is war in, in, in the country that we assign for. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, another uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I think one of the uh, our students, uh, Fiani, uh, if you can unmute. Uh, and talked about your questions. I think it will be quite interesting to share with the others. Uh. Uh, uh, Viani? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Viani. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Um, I, I think like I mentioned before, having to work from home with the relationship between co-workers. Um, uh, me, me, I can I feel that the engagement between us and us has become more challenging. Uh, it is uh, it the way that yeah. some of us haven't seen each other's face before. So, um, trust and collaboration cannot be built through the kind of situation. So, before the pandemic, arriving in meaning that we get to interact with our colleagues before the class started. But I feel like most of us built the rust and get to enter to each other, uh, not during the class period or the working hour, but the whole period of time when we find the our responsibility. So uh, what I read for, uh, after this pandemic ends, many said that we can expect to see more remote working or more uh, remote class uh, in the future. So uh, my question is, how can we build trust between colleagues, between colleagues during this remote learning or remote working situations? And also, moreover, if there are various cultures involved. Yeah. Right. Very interesting questions. And I suppose Craig uh, mentioned about uh, 
extending this trust uh, during the, uh, the the virtual interaction. So, what's your thought on this, Craig? Whether we are looking at a business or we're looking at education, we're all in this in a new a new experience for us as well as for everybody involved. And it's something that we don't necessarily have the answers to. You know, in a business, you will try to find social opportunities. You will have the opportunity to go out to lunch and so forth. When we're in a remote environment, we still need to look to find ways to create social opportunities. It can't always be in the box about work. And you've got to find ways or work with uh, both your managers, your, your company HR, the teams. How can we create something that is social? Um, I can't give suggestions as to how I would do that. Um, you know, I'm lucky. We've always had teams that get along very well. And our sociability comes through just simply sharing some jokes through WhatsApp and you know, having a chance where let's catch up for 10 minutes a day and have a chit chat and then shut Zoom down for a bit and then come back to the working environment. Now that works because we're a small group, we're a small team. In a larger organization, it's more of a challenge. But you know, as we evolve with this, we will also find ways to improve our socialization whether it be kindergarten kids learning for, through an iPad and having that interaction through to yourselves as university students, trying to find ways to connect with your classmates, through to us entrepreneurs, managers, and w people working to find ways that we still do connect. So it is possible, but there isn't an answer yet. You know, we're still experiencing the challenges we're finding out what does work. We're finding out a lot of things that don't work. And I hope that we keep that in our mind and say, look, never try this again. But it is, it is an evolution. You know, we, we were shut, uh, sorry, we were forced into a fundamental change in mindset for everything. And trust being one of those issues that we have to, you know, adjust to. But we're going to continue to adjust we find out what works. So many people globally are saying, look, we want to keep work from home. So if there is a strong proportion of the working population, for example, that likes work from home, there's obviously something about it that actually works for them as well. But they're obviously also finding those solutions to the very problem that you asked about. Very interesting discussion, yeah, and um, and again, yeah, uh, uh, you you. Uh, this is something that is currently ongoing. This is something that uh, 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 we, I can say discovering the undiscovered. So um, there's a lot of things that can change. There are a lot of things that we can seek out. Uh, this would probably be uh, an interesting research, Craig. What do you think? I mean. Uh, 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 for students, especially for the IB students who are interested in uh, taking this topic as your thesis, uh, uh, this can be one of them. Yeah, uh, um, discovering the undiscovered. I think that's a, a new terminology. Okay, in, the, in the one trust. minute. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. I think the trust came from uh, the teamwork itself. So you have to get the fundamental uh, or the essence how the teams is. Collaborate. Yeah. Uh, maybe the the, the uh, everybody also understand that team consists of together everybody achieves more. So when we know what the purpose of the team, and then uh, we um, share the burden of mm. achieving the, re the the target of the objective of the team, so we have to trust. Uh, our friends to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, you do it by yourself. Mm, mm. But we cannot do that uh, in a team. So in a team, you have to share the, the, the job, you have to share the responsibility. And then um, when the, uh, all the team members do their jobs and then uh, give the results to the team leader, we know that 
whether we can trust them or not, mm. whether we, they do the job as expected or not. But it's not stop there. There mm. will be always there always be uh, a continuation. There yeah. always be. Uh, 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 when you do something wrong or you do something bad or you do something that did not achieve the result there yeah. always uh, uh, we support the team member who did not do that the team leader uh, support them the other team members support them so trust come from each other yeah. trust from uh, all the team members so if you know the the purpose of the job and then uh, the purpose of the team and then we share the the responsibility uh, we trust them to do it and when they did not do as expected by us or uh, or by the team leader. There are always some changes or there is always some uh, improvement uh, how they are going to do. And then uh, we as the team member should support each other. And those support will give trust uh, to will build more trust, more trust between, yeah, yeah. between all the team members. So I think that's the how we. You yeah. trust your uh, uh, other team members in right. the team. And the interesting is that the fact that all the efforts to build this trust is by doing virtually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, thank you so much, Craig and Bayadi, for okay. this uh, very welcome, fruitful sir. discussions. Yeah. Um, we now can uh, summarize uh, our discussions by. Uh, mentioning the takeaway notes yeah um, to have competencies of knowledge skills and attitude uh, we need to provide those uh, uh, three um, capabilities yeah and most importantly is to have an, an, an adaptability skills that we are able to adapt to a new environment quickly and to have analytical skills the ability to think outside the box and to find solution and also to have a sense of discovering new territory the second take away notes is that in terms of building trust is also one of the aspects that uh, one must more one must achieve all right and during our discussions the form of building trust has changed from the person or in-person type of uh, situation into virtual mo types of situations. So um, there will be a changes. We don't know what uh, uh, the end of it, but there will be a change of cultures due to the fact that we are living in a new normal. And the third one, we keep on adapting not only adapting to cultures, but also technology. As we are currently doing, we are trying new things, trying new uh, uh, means of communications and also negotiations. Learning technology is not a hard thing, it's just the way we change our habits, we change our norms and we change our culture. So thank you so much, Fayadi, and You're thank welcome. you, Craig, for joining this uh, IBX International Business Talk. It's been a pleasure uh, for me to host uh, all of you. And also to uh, our students, um, thank you so much for uh, participating to these events, to prospective students and parents, uh, and to business uh, I, international business alumni, I would like to thank you to, uh, for joining this event as well. Uh, also for Venus TV for their assistance. Um, it's been great working with you, every one of you. And we will see you on the next IBX talk show with uh, a different topic and a very exciting conversation and discussion with our new uh, our speakers. All right. So until then, bye for now.